So it sounds like what you're describing here is that the second function of the law is for those who are in need of repentance. The third function is for those because the old Adam still clings. It, there seems to be a schizophrenia going on in those who oppose the third use of the law, namely that it's as if though they think the old man doesn't exist anymore, and yet we're constantly reminded that there's this symbol, and, and they constantly say we have to preach the second use. So how can this be? How can it be that we have an old man still there, but yet it's so clearly stated that this third use, this exhortation to good works is needed because the old Adam still clings? I don't have it. You have, you have summarized the problem. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer for it. Obviously, it's inconsistent. Um, the, this profound emphasis on the simul, and at the same time, then, a, a refusal to acknowledge and deal with what that actually means, the fact that the old Adam is still there, he's a problem, and, and we need to deal with him by means of the law. Uh, why there's that disconnect, I don't know. I mean, I don't understand it. It's, it's clearly wrong, uh, but I have no explanation for why uh, why they've made that move. Pastor Serberg, uh, you often use the term uh, new obedience. I, I mean, I know what obedience is. Why do you call it new obedience? Because it's worked by, by, work by the Spirit. Because it's obedience that's worked by the Spirit. Uh, and so identifies it as done in Christ. Naturally, the, the, the acts themselves don't look any different in terms of what's truly God's law than an unbeliever doing it, except uh, God doesn't consider those looks to be good. Hello, my name is Benjamin Steenbach. I'm a pastor of a Wells congregation in uh, Wisconsin. I would say that your description of, of Lutheran preaching at the beginning tracks uh, very well in Wisconsin Synod uh, circles as well, at least as, as the outcome of things. I went to seminary approximately 10 years ago, and... Um, I think there was an, an attempt to kind of deal with this uh, in which we were told, you know, to, to use what you might call sort of like a present tense exhortation, you know, like a, a Christian man is faithful to his wife. A, a Christian wife does submit to her husband. Um, and, and I wonder about your reaction to th that way of doing it. We were certainly, I remember at least, I don't want to slander my professor, so maybe this is just in my own head, but I seem to remember that we were kind of, you know, told to not use words, at least, you know, after you've preached the gospel, like must, need, ought, should, because that will just get you right back into feeling guilty again. Right. And that's, that's the tip, that's the same problem that I wrestled with. Uh, in terms of that base, I think there are different ways to speak exhortation and, and what you mentioned there, uh, there's certainly nothing wrong with it if we do it just exclusively that way, trying to avoid actual statements the way scripture will speak about actually you know, telling people to do things, you know, then it's, then it's not biblical anymore. So that we shouldn't shy away from that. But, but there's nothing wrong with speaking that way. Just I wouldn't make it the, the exclusive only way as trying to avoid a sort of more biblical forthright language. All right. So everyone has marked the Wells guy. And then we have... Yeah. <laughs> so you yeah, put up here. quotes. You put up quotes from Gerhard Ferdy and also from Stephen Paulson. And as I was reading those quotes... I immediately thought of what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it seems like they understand, they get what Paul is talking about. And you're saying that these two men are soft antinomians? Because what they're saying is you don't need to talk about it. You don't need to tell people to do it. It's just going to happen. Uh, and that, that's, that is the thing. So, you know, you have a biblical truth here. You know, does the gospel produce good works? Yes. But it's not as if it naturally and only does it. Uh, and that's where that, that Chemnitz quote uh, is so great. It's not so easy as if the good tree just always produces good fruit uh, because the old Adam is there. Because I'm trusting you that, that that's all they've said on that point. You, you did not quote before and after that quotation. It's more of the same. Uh, it's, not it, it is. it's not significantly different in terms of the point that he's making about good works. Yeah.
Excellent presentation. Thank you. Appreciate all the uh, citations. Let's see, scripture, confessions, fathers, uh, uh, no need to argue with that. I do have a question, but a backstory first. I remember one time a couple came uh, looking for, they, they were going to get married, looking for a church, and I said, well, check us out first. We, you know, I, I would never just say no, nor would I just say yes, unless they were members. So check us out. And they uh, took instruction. And I was pretty sure they were living together. Uh, both had a Christian background, but they'd been away from it for a while. At any rate, uh, in, in, the, in the catechetical instruction, got to Sixth Commandment and talked about, uh, you know, we wait for marriage. I will never forget the looks on both their faces. Their eyes got about this big, and they looked at each other. And I, I can, rem and I knew exactly what happened. The the that mirror went up, and they saw it, and they were terrified. Now I immediately then met that with justification, forgiveness, all that, and I could see you know, see the sweat starting to evaporate already. But uh, where I'm going is, yes, it, it it is the mirror. Is it also not just instruction? How else would we know what God wants? on how are our people going to know if we don't teach them from God's word? So that's the question. Is it not also simply instruction in the will of God? Well, I mean, and that's where it's, you know, the, the formula seeking to distinguish between uh, second use as accusation and third use as God's instruction. So you know, the same law and the spirit using it in different ways that it impacts those people. So on the one hand, uh, you know, they hear it first as something that accuses them of their sin. Uh, on the other hand, uh, having heard forgiveness in Christ and now wanting, how, how do I live in ways that are true to God's will? It, it's the same law, but the spirit using it in order to, you know, to teach and instruct about what that life is supposed to look like. Yes. Yes, Dr. Serberg. Um, it's interesting that uh, they, uh, people like Paulson and, and Ferdy um, kind of think that Luther villainized the law, uh, the gazettes, you might say, so that someone like uh, Paul Althaus Jr. Uh, said, he says, we can speak about the gabot and not the gazettes. Right. And then you also hear things like the second use of the gospel yeah, yeah. And, and, and so on. And, and of course, we are always reminded that the law is not a means of grace. Only the gospel is a means of grace. But it's still set, we still confess in, in the confessions that the, the Holy Spirit uses the law. And, and it is spiritual. And this just illustrates it. I mean, this is the, the point made uh, uh, in um, the book about third use of the law, that um, if, when you eliminate the third use of the law as a term, you create some other thing to fill its void. You always create another form of the law, so it becomes, you know, gospel exhortation or you know, all these kinds of terms. They're different terms for, for what is no different than the third use of the law. You've just tried to sidestep it. I do have a question. I'm uh, kind of a little, bit, a little bit confused because on the night of Jesus' betrayal, he said he would uh, ask the Father to send them the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will remind them all things uh, and tell them all things that Jesus has taught them. And in those things, I, I suppose that includes his good works. So uh, what do we need to preach again? That they should be preached, certainly, yes. No, I mean, you need a bit confused. If the Holy Spirit dwells in questions, the Holy Spirit will automatically tell questions to do good works, right? Uh, the, the, well, certainly the Spirit, uh, those who are in Christ, the Spirit does move them to do good works. Um, the problem is the old Adam is also there still resisting it. And so that's why um, we have this need to continue to hear the law, uh, both um, acknowledging our sin, but also then um, teaching us what is true and repressing and compelling the old Adam. So it's, if we were only new man, and it were only the spirit who's at work in us, uh, then we would just naturally do these things. Uh, but that's where uh, the presence of the old Adam necessitates that we need to continue to hear the law. Um, with the Reform versus Lutheran presentation of the third use of the law, I've understood that for Lutherans, it's more of an invitation that because you are in Christ, here is now your opportunity to uh, touch people's lives in a variety of ways with the law uh, guiding us. But the reforms seem to 
go back to more of a second use. Is that a correct understanding of reformed or am I off on that? Uh, I can't really speak to reformed and the way they speak about that. Uh, I won't claim to have a really solid knowledge of that. Okay, I just wanna make sure that I understand something properly because something that you said really struck me because in today's day and age, with a lot of different people and friends that are not Lutheran, they also use the term new obedience and they connect it to the Holy Spirit and being led by the Holy Spirit. And so there's a rejection of the third use of the law in favor of the Holy Spirit. And I really appreciated, if I'm understanding this properly, something that you said where you said, we don't use the law but the Holy Spirit uses the law. And that it seems that maybe I have been, in trying to work this out and talk with, talk with others, I've been sort of divorcing the Holy Spirit from the law, and yet it's not. It's together, and the Holy Spirit is using that law, the third use of the law. There, there's one us. law, and the Spirit uses it, and the Spirit applies it in the, so that it affects us as we need it, uh, and it can take place in a, you know, in a number of different ways. Uh, but certainly, we identify the Spirit as the one who's actually uh, utilizing the law. I and mean, that, that certainly is what the, the Form of the Concord says. 